Okay, we're going to continue with our series of lessons on meditations on Bible subjects. We have covered several, such as God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Bible, the gospel a message uh, in the Bible. Uh, we started last week on the subject of sin. We're going to continue that tonight. We'll start with the homework assignment, and this time I'm going to read the entire passage. I haven't been doing that for you, but realize it's probably not uh, that easy for you folks to have two things open at one time. So I'm going to go ahead and use my telephone tonight to read the uh, passage to you. So we're going to be in actually, uh, we're going to actually be in uh, John chapter 15, verses 18 through 25. John 15, 18 through 25. Follow along with me while I read. Jesus said, "If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of this world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you." A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. They have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without cause. Okay, as we read the words of Jesus one more time, I ask a few questions. And the first one was, this is, what is the world? Or who is the world? When Jesus says the world will hate you, what was he talking about? Well, the world that Jesus was referencing is the world of unregenerate people who would not accept him as Lord and Savior. Uh, this world is still filled with folks like that who will not accept Jesus as Lord. They will not bow themselves before his will. They will not do what he asks them to do. And that's one of the reasons why we have so much trouble in our world today. To this day, we Christians are hated by the world, which refuses to accept the truths of the Bible. And so we have to not be surprised when the world is in turmoil. And so many folks refuse to do what Christ asked them to do. Sadly, many from the world have, inf have also infiltrated the church, have never repented of their sins. And so the churches are also filled with folks who are, who are not really true followers of Christ Jesus. As our brother has been reminding us, we have to look like we know who our father is. So we have that one trouble that we're dealing with, uh, that, that folks have infiltrated the church that are not really saved, or they at least they're, if they're saved, they're, they're not really living as they should, and they have to repent and move on. Uh, when we get to verse 22, uh, Jesus makes a very difficult statement that I, have to, I think we need to explore a little bit better. He says, explain what Jesus means in verse 22 about them not having sin if Jesus hadn't spoken to them. Jesus said, if I hadn't told them what I told them, they would have had no sin. And Jesus in no way means that they would not have been guilty of sin because they were sinners from the start, and all men are sinners. All of sin falls short of the glory of God, according to Romans chapter 6, and first, or Romans, uh, 6 23. Uh, and then in Romans 3, 23, there's none who's righteous, not even one. So every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, and so we have this idea or this understanding that what Jesus is saying there has nothing to do with the idea that they had no sin. What he means is they would not be guilty of sin uh, because they would not be aware of their sin to have their conscience disturbed by the truth. Uh, they would think that they were without sin because they have no reason to, to test their knowledge against what is really right with God. So knowledge is a terrible thing. It can be a terrible thing because with knowledge comes great responsibility. The more that we know about how to behave like we should, the more responsible we are to behave like we should. So these folks had a choice. When Jesus taught them about himself, they could have believed him and they could have repented and became his children. Instead, they hated him and they turned against him. So Jesus says, if I hadn't spoken to them, they would not have had sin. They wouldn't have realized they had sin because they never would have known the difference. But now that they know the difference, they have to make a choice. He repeats, this, he repeats the same idea in verse 24, slightly different. Uh, but he says that when he came to reveal truth to them, uh, they, they had the responsibility then to decide to follow him, but instead they chose to hate him. Before Christ came and revealed the truth to them, they could be absolutely blissfully ignorant in their sin. Uh, once learning of their sin, though, they should have repented and changed. Instead, loving their sin more than God, they both hated Jesus and God the Father. Now, they didn't realize they hated God. They thought they were still serving God. But by doing what they were doing, they should have realized that they were not serving God when Christ showed them the difference that, that he showed them. Jesus proved everything that he said by doing miracles that they could observe and understand, and yet they still chose not to believe him. Now, we still have a similar situation in the church today. Uh, re repentance becomes a very challenging thing to us. If we learn to do better and we don't do any better, then it's still sin to us and we need to do better. We have to repent. Repentance means we have to change our thoughts and our ideas and our actions as we learn more. 
I'm all the time learning new things that I need to know and that I need to understand to be a good minister of God's word, to be a good Christian indeed. And so as I learn, I have to repent and, and grow. Uh, each one of us has the same situation we have to deal with. So when we're thinking about sin, sin is such a pervasive thing, such an invasive thing in our lives that it's very difficult to get rid of once we have it. Uh, and we, once we sin, it's very difficult for us to learn past the sin. Jesus made that absolutely clear to the folks that he was talking to at that period of time. They needed to understand that as they learn, they have to grow and they have to repent and change. So that's pretty much the idea that I wanted you to get from the homework assignment that last week. Just the idea that as we, as we learn, we have to grow and we have to, we have to develop our, our maturity in Christ and be what Christ wants us to be. Otherwise, then we're basically uh, ex exercising a futile, uh, a futile attempt at, at being what we need to be. If we're not really changing, we never will. We never will arrive where God wants us to be as fully mature Christians. All right now, let's get on with this. Uh, uh, this lesson last week, as we were talking about sin, uh, we we talked about several things concerning sin. In, in beginning with the idea, that there are several types of failings that will ultimately become sin, uh, and each one of these indicates a, a type of failing that that we need to be to be like God. So we looked at the word hamartia last week, which was missing the mark. We looked at the word uh, uh, anamas, which is against the law or, or acting against the law, you know, transgression against the law. We looked at the idea that if you know to do good, but you don't do it, then that's sin to you. So we looked at a failure to do good is also sin. Uh, there are the sins of commission, which we looked at the first two, the missing the mark and transgressions against the law. Then there is the failure to do good, which is a sin of omission. As we know to do good, but we don't do the good we should, then that's sin to us as well. And then it's also a violation of one's conscience. If we violate our own conscience, then we sin. Even if your conscience is wrong, uh, your conscience can be educated. But if you're acting against your conscience, then you're sinning against yourself. And therefore, it's a sin against God. So sin brings about separation from God and, and therefore spiritual and eternal death. That's pretty much what we covered last week in our lesson. Tonight, we're going to move forward with the idea uh, that there is only one solution for sin. And that is forgiveness by God the Father. Uh, so we're going to look at how we are forgiven tonight. We're going to look at the, the, the beauty part of this whole thing is that we actually can be forgiven by God. So let's go, if you will, in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. I'm going to be uh, recording all of this from the New American Standard Version that I usually use. It's 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. John says, And this is love, not that we loved God, that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, the idea of propitiation is where I want to start tonight. We'll actually look at several verses that deal with the idea of propitiation. The idea of propitiation is forgiveness from God, though the word forgiveness is really second secondhand in that idea. It's basically satisfaction before God for the, for the debt that we owe. So rather than being forgiven, we, we actually are propitiated for, which means that Jesus paid the price for our sins, and he went to death row instead of us having to remain there. Now, Jesus was put to death for us. He became a substitutionary sacrifice for us, so that by his death, by his stripes, we're healed. Uh, so he becomes the propitiation for us. He becomes the satisfaction that God demands and has to have because God is a holy and righteous God. A holy and righteous God cannot just wink at sin. He cannot. He must demand repentance. He must demand change. And so in order to make that possible for us to do what we have to do to be right with God again, he had to send us the propitiation that we needed. We cannot propitiate for ourselves. We don't have anything to offer to God once we've sinned and fallen short of his glory. This all takes place through the blood of Jesus. We, we're very familiar with these facts, but I just want to make it clear to you again. That only, the only thing that we can say that's good about sin is that it can be forgiven if we come to God through Christ Jesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. There are several things I want you to see here. Number one is the word redemption. See, we've been redeemed. We've been brought back and bought back by God from the sin that we deserved. Once we sinned, we became slaves to Satan, slaves to sin. God bought us back from our slavery, redeemed us from our slavery, set us free through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through his blood, through Christ's blood, that we have the forgiveness of our trespasses. Trespasses, of course, is that, that we did against the law of God, against his perfect will. And we can be forgiven for that only through the blood of Jesus. That becomes necessary for our buyback. We, we've been purchased with blood, and that being precious blood, not from cheap things like gold and silver and so on. And it's all been according to the riches of his grace. It's only by the grace of God only because God loved us more than he loves our death and our destruction, that God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us, that's, only the, that's the only way that we can actually have that forgiveness of sins. Sin is such a pervasive thing in our lives that apart from Christ and his blood, we would be lost forever in that sin, and we would have nothing to look forward to except an eternity away from God burning in hell forever and ever. It's a terrible thing to contemplate, but it's certainly the truth. So that required Christ to become flesh and be like us, except without sin. 
Uh, the whole idea of the incarnation is that Christ became like us so that he could experience life from our perspective, so that he could be tempted in all ways as we are. That's the Hebrew letter. And I'll read that in just a second. So that he could then become the person that we need him to be, the savior that we need, as he overcame those things and overcame the temptations and stood firm anyway on behalf of God and never sinned. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17 as we talk about these ideas. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. There's that word propitiation again. Uh, Jesus had to make things right with God. He had to become the sin for us so that we could have forgiveness for our sins. So he had to be made like his brethren in all things. We are his brethren. Anyone who accepts him, anyone who becomes like him has to be, are, are going are to be his brothers and sisters. So he, he is our brother that way. But he had to be made like his brethren in all things. All things meaning he had to be like flesh. He had to be flesh and blood. He had to be uh, able to be tempted like we are. He had to suppress all of his expression of deity when he was on the earth. But he could be nothing more than what we are as far as flesh and blood is concerned. The only real primary difference that he had was the Holy Spirit came to dwell upon him and remained upon him. Powered him to do the things that he did. Other than that, he was just like you and I and was uh, tempted in all ways, same as we are. He did that so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. And we're familiar with the idea of the high priest, the high priest being that uh, one person who could represent God and man and be the go between between them uh, in the first century, or I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, under the Mosaic law. Uh, Jesus becomes a new kind of high priest. He came not from the tribe of Levi like all other priests, but he came from the tribe of Judah. He had no progenitors, no, no family before him that, that were priests. Uh, so he becomes a very special kind of a high priest. He became a high priest that could be both merciful and faithful at the same time. Uh, the other high priests were everything but faithful. Uh, they all sinned as so they had to offer sacrifices all the time for their own sins. Christ rises above that. Uh, so he can, he, therefore, he can make propitiation for the sins of the people only because he was sinless himself. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 27 through 29. We look at this often. We're dealing with the Lord's Supper. As Jesus was instituting that supper, he made the comments that I think we need to look at concerning his blood that he was going to offer on the cross. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on till the day that I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Now, Christ drinks it new with us when we finally are in heaven. In the meantime, he drank it new when he was resurrected from the dead. But he says that we are to drink from all of, all of us for, are to drink from it because it's the blood of the covenant. Uh, his, his, it represents his blood. Of course, not actually, it doesn't actually become his blood. It's not transubstantiation. It's not true. Um, but but he, it becomes a representation of his, of his blood. So he tells us to drink from it because it's the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. We don't have forgiveness of sins except for the blood of Christ Jesus. We don't have forgiveness of sins. We don't have propitiation except that Jesus came to become like us. We cannot be forgiven for our sins unless we share in that, in that great meal, that great feast that Christ has shared with us before God. So as we eat of his flesh and drink of his blood in the, in the communion service, we're remembering what Jesus did for us and offering his body to, to break a, a hole through the veil or to cut a hole through the veil so we could go through the veil into heaven and also to give us his blood that pays the price for our sins that will give us the ability then to stand before God as pure people. So all these things God did in for, God did for us by sending Christ Jesus the Son. Apart from that, we had no forgiveness of sins, and we couldn't say anything good about sin, anything good about our, our recovery from sin. As we're concentrating and meditating on those things that are pure and holy and wonderful and good, uh, we can do that only because Christ died for our sins. One of the greatest blessings that we have from our forgiveness through Christ Jesus is we were freed from our bondage to sin. Uh, when, we, when we were living under sin, uh, we, were, we were bound by the laws of, uh, of sin and death. The law of sin and death is for every sin you, you commit, you die. First time we committed a sin, we died spiritually. The only way that we come back to God is through the law of the Spirit. The law of Spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. And that's one of the great blessings that we have through God and Christ. If you look at Romans chapter 8, verse 2, and then verse 12 and 13, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. We've been set free from our bondage. We've been set free from our slavery uh, by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, the spirit of life is that, that uh, bios life. Uh, not that bios life. I mean, it's that Zoe life, which is eternal life before God. Uh, we've been set free by the law of the spirit of life, of Zoe life, so that we can be set free from the law of sin and death. No longer when we sin do we die. Now when we sin, we repent, and our sins are paid for constantly by the blood of Christ Jesus. So then, brethren, he goes on to say in verse 12, 
you're under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So again, we have to change our lifestyle. We have to repent of our sins. We have to live as we as though we know who our Father is. I thank you, Brother Donald, for giving me such a ready phrase for, for my lessons here. Uh, but if you're living according to the flesh, you're going to die anyway. Even if you come to Christ and, and you've accepted him, if you go back to living like the flesh all the time, you start practicing sin on a regular basis. If you turn your back on God and on Christ and on the, on the sacrifice that he gave you, you will eventually die spiritually again, and you'll remain spiritually dead because there remains no more sacrifice for you after you reject Christ. But in the meantime, uh, if we, by the Spirit, are putting to death the deeds of the body, then we will live. And that's a wonderful thing for us to contemplate. We've got to always live as though we understand that we must be holy and righteous folks and not participating in the things of the world just because we can. All of this takes place because of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit are we able to be freed again from the sin that we have. The power of the blood of Christ Jesus is what pays the price for us. The power of the Holy Spirit is what informs us and keeps us ready to live for God. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, and verse 16 and verse 20. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man. Now, this, is a, this is a prayer from Paul on behalf of the saints at Ephesus, that God would grant them the ability, according to the riches of his own glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man. We know that when we are saved from, from our sin, when we are baptized into Christ, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, uh, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the gift which is the Holy Spirit to come and dwell inside us. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in our inner man, and he's empowering us in our, in our inner man, if we, if we, in fact, will let him do so. Uh, we know that we have power through the Holy Spirit because the Bible says that we do. You might not necessarily feel it, but you understand that God is like making it possible for his Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you through this world. Look at verse 20. Out of him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. That power that works within us is still the power of the Holy Spirit. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is able to do beyond everything that we think, more abundantly beyond anything that we think or ask of Him, more than we can even conspire or con conceive of asking from God, He's able to provide through His Holy Spirit to us. He's willing to do that because He wants us to be saved and He wants us desperately to remain faithful to Him. If you're not experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, there's a good possibility it's because you really haven't still uh, begun to live or try to live free from the sins of the world. The more that we participate in the sins of the world, the more we're going to be bound to this world, the more that we're going to continue to do the things of the world, the more that we're not going to have what we need from God. So we need to die to those things and realize that we are dead to them, start living as though we understand that we are people of God, live above the world and live above the things of the world, putting away the hatred and the, and the strife, putting away the sin and the lust and the, and the, and the, uh, the, uh, the other types of sins that we would be willing to commit, we need to get rid of all of those things so that we can stand before God, whole people, as whole people. We have to, in fact, die to sin. We have to be dead to sin. We have to be dead from sin because we were dead in sin. Now we've been relieved from that. We've been removed from that and saved by Christ through the blood of his, through the blood of his, his cross. And we became freed from sin. So now we've got to die to sin. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and your sins. That describes it before Christ. We're spiritually dead. We're separated from God. Awareness of sin is not enough for us to be delivered. Awareness of sin is not enough for us to be delivered. I'll say that one more time. Awareness of sin is not enough for us to be delivered. Now, the demons realize there's a God, but they tremble, but they don't change their ways. They never change their ways. They continue to be demons. Awareness of sin is not enough for us to be delivered, but we have to do something to be free from sin. What is that something we have to do? Which we have to die to it. Dead in sin, we have to be crucified. Crucified in our baptism, crucified by dying to ourselves and living for Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. May it never be, Paul says, as, after he asked the question, we go on sinning so that grace may abound? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Several things happen at the point that we're baptized, folks. It's why we are so insistent in the churches of Christ that baptism is essential to our salvation. I know there are some that are starting to abandon that even in the churches of Christ, but they should not do so because it's very, very important for us to understand exactly what's happening when we are baptized. When you're baptized, Paul is, Paul is writing to the church at Romans about what they already did and saying, did you not realize what you were doing? Did you not realize that when you were baptized, all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You cannot be saved until you died with Christ. You cannot be dead with Christ until you've been baptized into Christ. It's just the way it goes. Until we've been baptized into Christ, until we've been baptized into his death, you don't share in the death of Jesus. 
You cannot be resurrected unless you first died, folks. You cannot. Therefore, we've all been buried with him through baptism into death. So as we we're baptized, we're buried with Christ into his own death. So we're sharing with him in that gospel message. What is the gospel message? The gospel message is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And glorious living after that. So how do we participate in, in facts like that? We participate by baptism. We are dying to ourselves in baptism. We're crucified to ourselves. We're buried with him in baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead, the last part of verse 4 there, so that Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We are resurrected with Christ Jesus. We're raised from the dead and along with Christ. Uh, through the blood of Jesus, we're made clean. Through the propitiation that he provided for us, we're made pure. We're added back to the kingdom of God when we come to him in, in honesty, uh, and we're saved according to the plan that God put in place. Only if we follow that plan, we'll be saved, though. So we have to understand what the plan is. The plan was for us to die with Christ in baptism, be raised up again after our burial with him in baptism into death, be raised up again to newness of life, and then walk that new life. So we become new creatures as we're brought up out of the grave, uh, the, the watery grave of baptism, as sometimes we call it. Brought back up out of that grave, then we are back to life, and we're in a new life now. So we result in a different kind of a life. Look at verses uh, 6 and 7, still in Romans chapter 6. We'll drop down to verse 11 through 13 after that. Paul goes on to say, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. If you've never been baptized and your old self has been crucified, and you haven't had that body of sin removed. The body of sin is still with you, and as long as that body of sin is with you, you'll never be able to see God in eternity. All right? You just have to understand that that's the truth. Our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if you've really and truly died to yourself, then you're freed from sin. We no longer want to sin because now we want to live like God wants us to live. We want to live as those new creatures that God saved us to be. So how do we go on sinning and, and would we do so? Why would we do so? Well, this is because we really don't really care about being saved. Even so, he says in verse 11, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. We have to consider ourselves to be dead to sin. Not just giving a little vacation every weekend for sin or on the first day of the week from sin. No, we're actually dead to sin. Everything we can do in our power to get rid of sin, to be away from it, to be dead to it, we have to do. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because we were raised from the dead, we're now alive in God, we're alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lust, Paul says. We need to make sure that we're not obeying the lust that our, that our bodies are yammering for. We don't give in to our body just because it wants something. We only give in, we only give in to the spirit when the spirit says it's something that we should do that we need. So don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Don't offer your hands or your, or your feet or your, or your anything about yourself. Or certainly not your mind and certainly not your heart. Don't lend those to Satan any longer. Don't let them be used as sins of as instruments of unrighteous sin. Instead, he says, present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. We've died to sin, so we can no longer live in it. We're now instruments for God. Let's let, let's let God use us as he wants to. God desires to use us very richly in his kingdom if we will just let ourselves go and let us do that. In the meantime, if we don't do that, then we're going to find that we will be eternally away from God again. And we'll be dead back in our trespasses once again. So we cannot let our mortal, mem our, our mortal members be used. I'm sorry, we cannot let ourselves be used as... as um, members for, for Satan, we have to be used as members for Christ. We want to make sure that our body is, is alive from the dead and that we are safe in Christ Jesus as we serve him faithfully. We're then raised to a new life. All right, look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. I have been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised up with him through faith in the working of God, raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Folks, we've been buried with him. We were raised up with him again to a new life through faith in the working of God. We trust that God is able to raise us from, from the dead for eternity. We trust that God will take care of those things that we've committed to him until that day. He raised us up from the dead when we were dead in our transgressions and the uncircumcision of our flesh, when we were just regular old sinners and we didn't know Christ and we didn't know God. He made us alive together with him when we learned about Christ, having forgiven us all our transgressions through the blood of Jesus we know. So we no longer belong to the world. We have been freed from sin, slavery to sin, made alive and forgiven by God. Therefore, we have eternal life with Christ Jesus. Those things are only possible because Jesus died for us and came to this earth and became man. That's the only reason we can do these things. Freedom from sin is eternal life with God. So we have freedom from sin. We also have eternal life with God. And that's, the, that's the goal of everything that we're doing on this earth. 
if you're doing anything in this world that's not in, in keeping with your plan to be uh, an eternal resident of heaven, then, then you got a few more things on your plate than you still need, all right? We've got to get rid of everything out of our life that keeps us from living as God would have us to live, keeps us from being what God would have us to be, and keeps us from living that resurrected and new, new creature life. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13 as we continue our thought. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. God has given us eternal life. We haven't earned eternal life. We don't deserve eternal life. God has given us eternal life. It's a free gift from God. It's grace from God. And this life is in his son, in Christ Jesus, which is the only way we can get into Christ Jesus to be baptized into his name, into his possession, right? So baptism is important to us. This life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. If you're in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus is in you, then you have the life already. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. You don't have eternal life if you're not in Christ Jesus. If you haven't been baptized in his name, all you have is a certain expectation, a fearful expectation of eternal life away from God in hell. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Folks, can we really know? I think we, I think so many of us are, are living a life of doubt still. We, we, we've been saved and we know we've been saved, but we don't know for sure if we're going to make it to heaven. There are so many folks that I've met that will say, well, we can't really know until Christ comes again and judges us. But you better know, folks. You better know that you've done what Christ asks you to do. Now, yes, we do make some, some mistakes and we sin and fall short of God's grace even after we've been raised from the dead. But we know we have forgiveness of Christ, forgiveness of those sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, which keeps us continually clean. We don't take advantage of that fact. We try not to ever do sin again. But we sometimes will sin and we'll fall short of the glory of God. When we do that, we're just thankful that we have forgiveness through Christ. One thing we can know is if we are in Christ and Christ is in us, if the Holy Spirit of God dwells in us, then we have eternal life. It's promised to us with a, with a, with a promise that is ironclad. So we have freedom from sin as eternal life with God. In John chapter 17, verse 3, when Jesus is praying that final prayer of his life, uh, that, that long prayer that he prays before God uh, that we sometimes call the high priestly prayer of Jesus, he says in that prayer, this is eternal life, they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Folks, knowing Jesus means obeying Jesus. Salvation that we have is, is based upon the fact that we know Christ well enough that we're going to do what he says. We know God well enough to do what he's going to tell us to do. We'll be commandment keepers and commandment obeyers. We'll do what God wants us to do at all times. That's what it means to know God. Not just to know about God, but we actually know God. So eternal life is that we know him, we know God, the true God, and then we know Jesus Christ, the Lord, who God sent. That's basically how we are freed from sin, and that's one of the greatest blessings that we have is that freedom from sin. Let's go ahead and assign your homework for next week, and, and I'll, I'll cover it again with you as I do each week. But uh, uh, I'd like you to, to think of a little bit more about sin and freedom from sin. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 25. If you'll take a picture of your screen or whatever you need to keep that in your, in your mind. Then I have several questions that I want to ask of you. Number one, in verse 21, it says that we are called to suffer. What kinds of suffering will, will the honest Christian face? It should be will the honest Christian face. What kind of suffering will, we, will the honest Christian face? What will we be having to do by way of suffering? In verse 23, I have to ask the question, what was the demeanor of Jesus in suffering? Where was his faith and his trust, and how did he face the suffering that he had to face? Did he face it with doubt? Did he face it with reluctance, or did he face it with, with willingness? All right, uh, You're going to discuss that in more detail than I just gave it to you. In verse 24, Christ's death on the cross was for what reason? Why did he die on the cross? What kind of healing did we receive as a result of that? And what does the Bible say happened at that point of that death? You look at verse 25. What does it mean to stray like sheep? All right, uh, We've strayed like sheep. At, at what point in time did we stray like sheep? And so on. I just want you to give me a full theology on straying like sheep and what Christ has done to bring us back to God. That's basically our homework for tonight. That's our lesson for tonight. Thank you for your time in class. Now we'll just close this down and we'll be ready to continue with our uh, closing prayer and our discussions, whatever we want to do. Give me a second.